Well, good afternoon and welcome to the homestead. My name is Jonathan. Thank you so much for taking time out to join us for episode 7 of Porch Talk. Today we're going to be turning inward and we're going to be studying our response to tragedy and how we deal with situations that come up in our life uh, that are difficult, that are challenging, uh, that oftentimes can produce suffering, whether psychological or, or physical. And uh, it's important for us to take time out to, to plan and to understand why we respond to things the way that we do and to plan on how we're going to uh, deal with situations when they come up. Now, of course, in life, it, things are very, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. And so uh, you can't be prepared for everything. Uh, you can't know what bad things are going to happen. We, we can know what the risks are. Uh, in fact, you know, go, go talk with any insurance company. They, they are masters. They spend millions of dollars, maybe even billions of dollars, uh, understanding and calculating and figuring out what the probability is that certain types of disasters or accidents or, or problems uh, will occur. And that's how they base uh, their liability and how much cash they need to keep on hand and uh, how much they charge us for premiums for insurance. And so it's a big business in the world, but more importantly, it's a it's a very important personal uh, thing that, that occurs in our lives. And uh, when we're confronted with tragedy and, and difficulty, um, we can feel like we're prepared. We can, you know, there, there are people in the world that are phenomenal psychologists and, and pastors and spiritual leaders and and uh, you know others in the medical profession that that study human response and and study uh, you know how how that all works. But at the end of the day, when tragedy strikes your life, it's just kind of like a bomb went off, and so now you are you are facing uh, you know that that challenge and dealing with it the way that you have prepared to deal with it, the way that you haven't prepared to deal with it, um, maybe the way different situations and conditions in your life that. Uh, have occurred. They have uh, kind of conditioned you to produce certain types of responses in certain kinds of stressful environments. And and so we have all kinds of crazy things that we'll do when we get into those situations. And I have found in my life, it, it's a much better plan to, um, to, to know and to understand what my psychological response is going to be, um, to know and understand how God intends us to deal with uh, tragedy and, and difficulty as it comes into our life, uh, because we can either be you know, lost in the woods, uh, to, to, to use a, an analogy, or we can uh, understand that we might get lost in the woods, and so there are some tools that we can carry with us uh, to to handle that situation if and when it comes, you know, things like a compass or uh, a, a satellite phone. Uh, you know, there are different ways that we can handle navigating in the wilderness, just like uh, there are different ways we can handle navigating the hardships that come in life. And so today, I, I don't necessarily want to look at any specific type of tragedy. You know, I think the principles that we're going to talk about today uh, apply whether there is a complete nuclear holocaust and life as we know it has changed forever or just uh, something small that happens in our life. And it doesn't even need to be uh, something on a, a very large level. Uh, it could be something very small, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, someone at work, you know, didn't treat you the way that, that you expected them or a promotion didn't go the way you thought it would or or parenting has turned out to be different and, and more challenging than you thought it was uh, or, uh, you know, m many other different things. So there's there's a pretty vast uh, plethora of things that can occur t in our lives. And so rather than preparing for each of those specifically, which is never a bad idea, but today we're going to kind of take a macro view and look at all those situations to understand how the human mind works and how we're conditioned to respond and, and, uh, and then be informed by the scriptures, which tell us how to handle these types of situations uh, as they come. And they will come. Um, I can guarantee you with 100% uh, probability today that you're going to face a, a difficulty or, or a hardship of some type. And so uh, they come to all of us. That's just a part of being human. And until uh, we go home to be with the Lord, that is that is how uh, life will be here on earth. And I and we know that, that God doesn't desire us to live in fear. 
The Bible said he's not given us a spirit of fear. We know that we're commanded to live an abundant life. And so just just surviving, getting along, kind of ducking our head, keeping our head down, just trying to stay in the game, quote unquote, is not what God intended for us to do. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to to live in peace and to to uh, approach situations in the right way, taking uh, the right amount of risk. Uh, and being bold and, and uh, uh, not just cowering in fear and just letting what might happen uh, cause anxiety and fear in our life. And of course, where most of us are familiar uh, with, with Paul's command for us to, to be anxious for nothing. And so it's very important for us to handle uh, situations as they come. And in fact, really, uh, when we are faced with difficult situations, it, it can be really telling um, you know, where our true faith lies, uh, whether we have faith in ourselves or in things of this world or in the Lord, uh, those those truths of what we really believe come out during those times. And so we're going to be talking about that today. And if you have a Bible, if you would turn to me to uh, or join me in turning to Psalms chapter 34, I'm going to do that myself. And uh, we're going to examine some verses beginning in verse 14 here in Psalms that I think are really great. Uh, and uh, the, in fact, a lot of times we don't necessarily always see Psalms as the, the genre of uh, literature in the Bible that uh, gives us direction uh, in terms of these types of things. But we do find that many of the Psalms are written about times of hardship and, uh, and the human mind and how, how we have responded as, as fellow human beings uh, in those times of hardship and difficulty and uncertainty. And I think they inform us and direct us as to how we should respond and how we should uh, handle those things. So even if you're not faced with tragedy right now, maybe you're just going through life, things are great, and you're just thinking, man, uh, you know, I don't know that I want to to dive into the <laughs> to my own human psyche today. I'm not sure I want to explore my mind and my behaviors and understand more about that. Um, and maybe today you don't, but there is a day coming where I think this will be very beneficial. I know that it's been beneficial to me in my life, and so I invite you to, uh, to go through this exploration with us this afternoon. All right, so let's, let's begin in verse 14. Again, we're in Psalms chapter 34, where it says, Turn away from evil and do what is good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil, to erase all memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those with a crushed spirit. Many adversities come to the one who is righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. So let's just take this apart and and, uh, begin to understand what the psalmist here is trying to help us understand about dealing with situations of hardship and difficulty. Beginning with with verse 14, we have a clear command here to turn away from evil and do what is good. So we need to immediately know that if we are stuck in the middle of a situation where we are participating in evil, we're causing harm, uh, to someone else, or we are in a situation that's outside of God's will, then we can know already that that we are entering into a place of darkness. We are entering into a situation in a place where where we will bring pain and suffering upon ourselves, if not in the immediate future, in the longer term future. And so we want to immediately stop what we're doing and, and turn away and get away from that situation. So, so pr- that's probably not most of us right now, might be a few of us listening, uh, but that's really the first thing you want to do. Now, after that, once you're outside of that situation, then we know that we're commanded to do what is good and to seek peace and to pursue it. So peace ought to be really our life motto, uh, uh, that that ought to be something that we are uh, seeking out. In fact, Jesus himself, he, he, he identified himself, and of course the prophets did as well, as the Prince of Peace. So fascinating to me that uh, that is one of those uh, proper nouns that we identify our Savior with uh, is a Prince of Peace or a person of peace. 
And so it's important that we too are uh, are like that in character, and that we 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 have a desire to take that on. So maybe just take a moment in your life and just kind of assess that as well. Are are you a person of peace? Is that something that as you have your quiet time, as you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about your day and, and how you're going to go about your day? Is peace a a primary goal for you? Is it an important part of your plan for the day? Or are you an agent of chaos, an agent of disorder, an agent of of, uh, of problems and, and obstructions and, and calamities and, and damage? Uh, so that's something we need to make sure that we're on the right side of, of the situation. Because there there is nothing I can say um, if you are walking away from God's plan and purpose for your life. And, and, and even more generally, if you're walking away as a human being from how he has ordered his creation to work... Well, then you are walking, in essence, towards destruction. That that is the end game, the end result of of that decision. And so, I would, en- <coughs> excuse me, I would encourage you to uh, to avoid that. All right. Then in verse fifteen, we see now that we've kind of laid the foundation. It says, "The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their cry for help." So we know that when we are pursuing God's will in our life, which which that is what makes us righteous. Now, works are, are an important part of the result of who we are in Christ. Um, but also, as we pursue righteousness, uh, as we pursue a godly lifestyle, as we do that, then we can see here in the Psalms that the eyes of the Lord are upon us and that he does hear our cries. And this is really important because uh, in that moment that we are first faced with that tremendous challenge, it sounds like we have a, in fact, I will, I will direct the camera over here. Oh wait, wrong way. I don't know if you guys can see Israel over there. Yeah, I guess you, he might be out of view. You might, you guys might be able to see him. He's, I think that little bar here, I'm going to probably mess up my view. Yeah, now you can see him. That is Israel. And he is, uh, the reason why we called him Israel is because we found him uh, coming out of the wilderness one day. His mom had abandoned him uh, through some trauma uh, of her own that she had experienced. And uh, and so we called him Israel. We, he, he became a bottle lamb, obviously, and uh, against all odds survived a, a night alone in the wilderness by himself with no food His after being alive for about three hours of his life. Uh, so, and then he has a, he has a friend, which you probably can't see over there. I don't know. I tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll get really bold here and probably regret doing this. I'm going to zoom the camera in. Oh, no, I guess it, I can't zoom in this mode. It won't let me, but his friend Judah, (laughs) all right, which is if you're a Old Testament, uh, familiar with the Old Testament, you know that Judah was the, uh, the, the other kingdom uh, that uh, remained faithful to the Lord when Israel turned away. Uh, his friend Judah's over there too. They're in this the 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 pen with, under behind the electric netting that keeps them safe from uh, from predators and other things. So anyway, hopefully he'll calm down uh, in in a few minutes once he realizes that uh, it's not time for him to get a bottle, uh, but rather it is time for him to be a a lamb of peace out there in the pasture and just uh, relax and enjoy the nice weather that we're having. All right, so we want the Lord's eyes to be upon us because in those moments where things go wrong and we, we have that immediate sense of shock and, and awe and, and, and concern about what's happening and, and we're in that, that moment of disillusionment where, where everything that was normal uh, is now becoming or seeming to be abnormal, we, we need to have an understanding that God is still God that he has a plan and purpose even in this this terrible situation that we're facing and that he has the strength and the wisdom to see us through it. And so if we if you don't have that, then what you have is chaos. What you have is a rush of adrenaline and a psychological response of hopelessness and frustration and it makes it hard for us to think, it makes it hard for us to respond. Uh, how do I know that? Um, well, yes, on the one hand, I do have part of my undergraduate degree is in uh, psychology, but more importantly, uh, I have experienced life and uh, understand that uh, that is a response that I uh, often have when I'm faced with a difficult situation. And as I grow and become more like Christ, and as I become uh, more thoughtful and mindful about uh, how God desires for me to live and to follow after Him, 
uh, hopefully I am becoming less and less reactionary and, and, and having a, a, an emotional response and an unhealthy response to those stressors. And then rap, but instead of that, then I have uh, a peaceful response. And, I, and, the, and the first part of that begins with this understanding right, right here, that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Now, if we are in rebellion against God and, and, and we, we are not submitting to his authority and not submitting to his lordship in our life, well then, uh, yeah, I mean, we, that, that's a problem. That's why you want to solve that problem when things are peaceful rather than, uh, solve that or, or, you know, go through that situation, you know, really in essence, kind of, kind of alone. All right. Um, and it says his ears are open to the cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to erase all memory of them from the earth. And that's a very literal thing. I mean, we've seen many in, in several instances where God immediately and decisively and dramatically with the flood, with the, the uh, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where he does remove evil. Other times he's patient and he waits and he gives opportunities for repentance. But ultimately, in the end, uh, this whole earth will pass away and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and all evil will be destroyed and will become no more. So it's very important for us to understand that it, that we do need to be on the right side. You know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that when you've you've lived this life apart from God and and uh, you're never concerned about anything that he's concerned about and you're just kind of doing your own thing, then all of a sudden when you have a problem and then you're just expecting God to come and deliver you, then uh, here we see that 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 presents a little bit of a problem. Now, if that's the case, and, and you've lived an ungodly, rebellious, anti-God kind of life, does that mean God won't hear you? No, uh, that's not what it means. He always hears us. In fact, we know that, that there is never a place we can go that God can't hear us, and so we do have that. But not walking with him, we have, in a sense, crippled ourselves uh, to where we, we're going to always struggle to handle situations, um, uh, not handle them well. And I want to maybe make a quick disclaimer here. There are there are physiological conditions which can affect this normal response, this normal behavior, our, our normal way of processing information and thinking. So our context today is dealing with the assumption that you're, you know, quote, unquote, in your right mind. You might say, well, I'm not sure that any of humanity is really in their, quote, unquote, right mind. I'm not sure that I can argue that point, but there is kind of a... a a situation where you have a, a healthy functioning brain and so all of these these lessons that we're discussing today apply to that if you don't have a, a healthy brain well then then there's going the situation is going to be a little different so just to to be clear and make sure that when when we're talking about this being a macro view it's only macro in the sense that you know you you have a a, a normal functioning brain that, that does not having you know uh, any physiological or physical problems or defects or things that would would not not allow us to process information and, and such. And so we just have to trust that the Lord deals with those situations appropriately and, 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 and we'll, that's not something we can really speak to today. All right, going on, it says, um, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and he delivers them from all their troubles. Now let's just take a minute there because we do have that all-inclusive word all there. And uh, at first glance, it can be a little bit of a troubling verse to process because we can oftentimes think in our life, uh, especially for those of us who have walked with the Lord for any length of time, where we cried out to him in a time of distress and he did not immediately solve all of our troubles. Uh, the issue that we have here is we, we don't have the word uh, immediately. See, that's the problem. That's the thing that, that is, uh, that's missing there in our assumption. It just says that he delivers them from all their troubles. So what my experience has been is, is that the meaning of that is that he begins that process of healing and restoring and bringing us back to a place of peace. But there is a journey that we have to travel. And it is that journey that none of us likes. And I will be the first one to, to raise my hand and say, I don't like the journey. I like the beginning. I like the end of most every situation in life, I hate the middle part, right? Where all the hard work comes. It's like, you know, writing out the workout plan. That's the fun part. Implementing it, not so fun. 
And but yet that is uh, the truth of the situation. So I think we do have to just have a moment um, of, of reflection to understand and to recognize and maybe accept that that uh, perhaps harsh reality that God is not going to immediately deliver us from all of our problems. It says the righteous cry out. So that's what we do. We cry out. Number two, the Lord hears. So he hears us when we cry out. Here's the righteous. But he delivers them from all their troubles. So he does deliver us, but not necessarily immediately. Sometimes he does immediately. And, and praise God, when that happens, that is a really good day. Um, but we don't really have to think too much about that because when that happens, well, we're out of it and we're, we're in that place of peace. But it's what happens to us when he doesn't immediately deliver us, which honestly, I mean, that is most of the time probably in life. He has to allow the natural consequences of, of things to occur. That is how his creation works. He can't violate his own laws, his own physical laws, his own spiritual laws. He can't violate cause and effect. If he does that, then he begins to change how his creation works and it begins to change uh, free will and uh, all of the things that they are involved in uh, pursuing him. And so he, he has to be care- thoughtful about that. Now, are there times where God deliberately and specifically acts uh, within those parameters in creation? Well, absolutely. We have times, you know, we have many miracles that Jesus performed. We have Moses uh, parting the waters in the Red Sea when the Israelites escaped captivity in Israel. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of, of uh, you know, quote unquote supernatural uh, events or things that we cannot sp- explain that are outside of our understanding that occur uh, that that God does, but as those are exceptions to the rule. He he never violates the rule as a general uh, saying. So that's why we can count on this this the accuracy of these scriptures here, because uh, his word establishes the order of things in the law, and it is through those things in which we we live and understand and and we learn and and adapt. So let's take uh, some time then today and let's focus on the journey, the journey through grief, the journey through hardship, the journey through uh, sudden trauma. Um, While all of those situations are different and the emotional response that we can have are different and, and the outcomes and the consequences and how we respond can be different, generally I would contend and if you're watching our sermon series on Sunday morning, you know that Pastor Scott has challenged us to contend rather than to defend. So I'm going to challenge you to contend today uh, with me that it is through that journey that there are some basic biblical principles and basic psych- uh, psychological uh, principles that apply to how the human brain works and how our response system works. And we can be informed by understanding that and understanding how the flesh is and in bring it under submission of Christ, bring it under the conformity of how God has told us to handle those situations so that the journey uh, of our, our time, you know, to use, <laughs> to use our little bottle lamb over there, uh, Israel, to use uh, that as a more historically accurate picture of the nation of Israel, how they uh, responded uh, and, and how God led them through that wilderness time so that at the, at the appropriate uh, time, uh, after they'd gone through their time wandering in the wilderness, they could enter the promised land. In our case today, that would be that place of peace in life. So let's take uh, just a few moments and let's explore basically the human response um, and to under- so that we can understand ourselves. Uh, I mean, you know, understanding, know, knowing ourselves, understanding how we respond to stress and, and trouble and difficulty can help us because we are, we are comforted knowing that we're, we're experiencing the, the normal response. Because there is a lot of times when we are uh, suddenly struck with a, a catastrophe or uh, we have an, an uncertainty that enters in our life, one of the things that we think or one of the beliefs that we can often has, have is that we're all alone, that we're experiencing this, no one else is experiencing this, everything, everyone else is fine, but it's only us. Uh, that's in trouble. And we know that that's not true. Everyone experiences trouble and hardship. It may not exactly be in the same way or at the same time, but everyone experiences that trouble. So one of the first, uh, and and I'm going to suggest today or contend today that there are four stages. Um, Oftentimes we call them the four stages of grief, but these stages are are pretty pretty well uh, similar in, in any kind of of unexpected uh, stress that comes into our life. 
And one of the reasons why we do have, because you might be saying, well, well, how come we have a reaction? Like, why do we all go nuts whenever tragedy strikes? And, and uh, one of the main reasons for that is that, that we have um, in part of our adaptation mechanism that God gave us is that we, ha- we experience this worldview or this perception of reality, whether you want to go philosophical or theological or psychological or what. But we have this, uh, this condition, uh, psychological condition, that, that is called normalcy bias. Normalcy bias means that, that there is kind of a standard by which events tend to occur. And so we expect them to continue to occur that way. All right. So what would be some examples of normalcy bias? Well, most Americans uh, are live in normalcy bias, right? There was not uh, a, a ground war being fought state to state or city to city in our nation, you know, pretty much ever for, for most of us. Now, there are a few exceptions for that uh, with 9-11 and other things that have happened, but generally... That, that would be an unusual event. If bombs started falling out here in the field, that would be an unusual event. That would not be, quote, unquote, normal. So my bias is that since the last 45 years of my life, bombs have not fallen in my backyard or out in the field there, that tomorrow also they will not fall. The, the problem comes when tomorrow comes at some point and the bombs do fall. And there is a ground war on in my country in which I live, or there is some some unusual thing like that. Then all of the sudden, my normalcy bias has a psychological trauma, meaning that what was expected to happen didn't happen. Something else happened. So now instead of me going about, you know, my routine, maybe I'm, you know, I'm going to get up, I'm going to drink some coffee, I'm going to get ready to go to work, I'm going to head up to church, or I'm going to go you know, visit somebody or, or have them go to a meeting, whatever it is I would normally do in my routine. Now that whole thing is out the window, right? My routine is wrecked. Uh, my comfort level may be wrecked because there may be things on fire and there may be shrapnel coming through and breaking all the windows of my house. I mean, it's, it's, it's pure chaos as far as my brain is concerned because it was not expecting that. Now, if you have lived in a war-torn country, or maybe you're in the the armed forces and you experience that type of battlefield drama, uh, once you have adapted to that, and and there is a a process that, that, you know, our our troops have to go through and and a process certainly that civilians go through when they live in war-torn countries, that can become normal. Right now, I'm not saying it's easy or comfortable that you're just completely at peace. But what I'm saying is my response to that stress would would be much more heightened and uncertain than, let's say, uh, someone who lives in Afghanistan or Syria or in Israel or some other place where it would not be unreasonable to expect bombs or missiles. And I know we don't really have bombs anymore, but, uh, you know, I'm using that as kind of a, a euphemism. You know, missile launches, missiles landing in the field. That If that happens several times a year, well, then if that happens, well, of course, you're alarmed. You're going to respond to that. You're, you don't desire that that happens. You're not completely comfortable, but you, you have some experience with that. So, you know, here's what we do when that happens, then we do this. We, we find shelter here, or we grab our rifle and go out to, to face the enemy. You know, what, whatever the situation is, whatever the appropriate response is, you, you are somewhat conditioned that that is a semi likely, or maybe even a normal uh, response, especially if you, you know, live through the Iraq wars or, or, you know, different places where there's just constant uh, carnage and trouble. You know, it's always crazy to see people walking through the street. Uh, you know, missiles are crashing into buildings and people are just going on about their lives, you know, carrying on trade and, and things going to work just like normal. And we would look at that and just and just think, well, that's that's crazy. You know, they're just walking around. Aren't they afraid of, you know, getting hit by, you know, shrapnel or whatever. But for them, that has become normal. And so they just adapt to that and they're just living their normal, quote unquote, life. So I hope that gives at least, you know, we could spend several hours talking about normalcy bias and understanding, but but hopefully that gives you some idea of what we're talking about. So when things happen that are unexpected, especially if our perception is that they're going to have a negative outcome, we begin these stages, these four stages of response, all right? So what are the four stages? Well, usually the first stage is denial uh, or shock or uh, disbelief or, you know, we just... Uh, at first, it's hard for us to accept, and 
again, because of normalcy bias, because we're used to expecting whatever is normal for us. Um, you know, if, if, if vi- in fact, it can be the opposite. If violence is what's normal and you expect peace and kindness and, and help, well, then that can be equally uncertain and stressful. And, and so it's not necessarily that, you know, as clear as what we might imagine in our minds. So the, the first thing that we often do in those situations is that we, we're denying that. You know, we're in shock. You know, we, and, and people often say, oh, my, or no, that didn't, surely that didn't happen. Or, or you know, we'll, we'll bargain in some way psychologically to say, well, you know, we'll try to explain it away. Well, maybe I'm just... You know, maybe I watched too many war movies and I didn't really, you know, this explosion that I just saw and heard out here, maybe I just imagined it. You know, we, we just start to think irrational thoughts that defy what our senses are telling us. You know, if, if bombs are falling in the, in, in the field and we see that, we, we hear that, I uh, probably smell the, the smoke, the, the gunpowder, the ash that's in the air, uh, you know, then even though we're, our senses are recording that that is occurring, a lot of times we have a difficult time accepting that. You know, when our, when our boss tells us we're fired, when our, when our spouse tells us they're leaving and never coming back and they want a divorce, uh, when we get terrible news that a child or a parent or a close friend has been killed, uh, you know, our, our immediate, because that is not the norm, you know, especially, you know, in, in some of those more extreme cases like loss of a child, if you've, if your child's 25 years old and your whole life, every day of your life, they're alive, they're fine. And then one day they're not, that's very difficult for our mind to, to grasp that, to get a hold of the fact that something that has been consistent for, I don't know, what is that? 365 times 45, whatever that number is in the th- tens of thousands um, of days of it being a certain way. Now it's changed that is difficult. It takes our mind time to, to assess and, and accept that. So that's why we go through this, these stages of trauma or these stages of grief because our mind is having a hard time uh, getting itself wrapped around what's actually happening, really accepting. Uh, because normalcy bias is what helps us. You know, oftentimes we see it as always negative, that normalcy bias, you know, is, is negative in the sense that it, you know, we're unprepared for certain abnormal events. But really normalcy bias is what helps us function in life. If I was constantly concerned about or having to make provision for bombs falling in the field when it's never happened before, I would be spending a lot of unnecessary time preparing for something that's not likely right? Uh, Not that we shouldn't be prepared for that contingency, but we want to prepare appropriately. If I get a helmet on and I'm standing out here with my rifle expecting for the enemy to come over the hill, uh, you know, for half my day, then that's an unreasonable amount of time to be uh, expecting that. But yet that's what happens a lot of times when we have, have a trauma that comes into our life, that we start to have unreasonable responses to that. And so uh, our, immediately, uh, our immediate natural response is denial. So one of the best things that we can begin to do is, is to begin to uh, uh, believe and trust and, and accept that even though what we're seeing is very traumatic, it's very hard, it's very difficult to expect, it, it wasn't unexpected. God, at the very least, expected it. We know that life is full of trouble and that, that even though the odds may be extremely unlikely that this situation is happening to us, uh, or they're probably more likely than what we think, that, it's, that we, should ju- we should work towards acceptance of that, to believe what we see, to believe what we hear, um, and, and to begin to deal with it rather than to avoid it or to, to fall into some of the traps of that immediate denial or shock, you know, or to be paralyzed in, in fear, for example, is, is what happens sometimes. That's, you know, where the expression a deer in headlights comes from, that, uh, you know, some, a deer is so shocked sometimes when it sees the car coming down the road towards it, it just stands there and gets hit. Right. Uh, I mean, usually not, but oftentimes it can because it's just it's paralyzed with fear and we can do the same thing uh, ourselves. All right. So once we, uh, you know, we get out of that phase, you know, hopefully in a healthy way where we just begin to say, okay, this is really happening. And instead of panicking or having a severe emotional response, uh, what I'm going to do is to begin to take steps to. uh, make the situation better or to solve the problem that the situation has presented. All right. And that leads us to the next stage, which is often, and again, these stages don't always apply, apply to everyone all the time. Uh, we tend to take longer, have a hard time transitioning from one stage to the next. So I want to make sure I'm not 
I'm not portraying this as a one size fits all. I'm just, these are just general guidelines that can help inform us and help guide us as we go through that stress or that tragedy. So the next, the first, usually the first step, just because of our human, because of our sin nature, the next first step, once we begin to, to accept like, okay, this is really happening, is to become angry, right? We kind of go into our, uh, or, or we continue to the next phase of our fight or flight response. And oftentimes if we've decided to fight, uh, then we're angry, right? We have rage, we have adrenaline pumping through our veins and we're, we're amped and our senses are heightened and, and we're just, we're ready to react, right? And that, that's just a, that's a natural response because it, it prepares your body. Your brain is basically preparing the body to, to, to act, to move, to do something. So it's not necessarily a negative response, right? Now, obviously, we don't, we don't want to act out on that response because we might hurt someone or hurt ourselves or do something destructive that is not going to solve the problem. So I'm not suggesting in any means that we act out on that, but I think it's okay to, to understand our body is going through a, a psychological state of preparedness, that we're preparing to deal with the problem, we're, we're preparing to act, and uh, anger oftentimes is kind of the overflow of that. Um, you know, when, once we're kind of in that state, now we begin to look to understand, well, who, we, and we ask the question, whose fault is it? Who's to blame? You know, who, if, if bullets are flying at you, then the natural question is, well, who's shooting them? Right. And because you're, you know, you're angry that you're being shot at, you're, you're ready to shoot back and make the bullet stop. Right. And so expand that analogy into whatever the, the, the trouble is. So, you know, if you've, if you've just, you know, you're, you're, you've just gone through a, a difficult, you know, something happened, somebody said something mean about you to your boss and it, and it's tainted his view of you. And, and now, all, and everyone at work doesn't like you anymore, quote unquote, or at least that's your perception. Then now you're angry. You're looking to know who did that, who said that. And, and, and we immediately see ourselves as innocent and everyone else at fault, right? Because the, that's part of the sin nature too. The sin nature always makes the assumption that we're innocent. We're not at fault. It's always excuse me, it's always someone else's fault. And so, you know, we're ready to pull out our rifles and take them out or draw our swords or, you know, our clubs or whatever. And so that, so we, we go through kind of this phase where we're, we're, we're aggressive, we're angry, we're ready to blame, we're ready to take out, you know, the, the, and that's, you know, in an active shooter situation, that can be a positive thing because now your senses are heightened. And, uh, you know, rather than stand there while everyone gets killed, you're ready to act on the shooter and take them out. Uh, so it, it's just, it's a, it's a response to understand. And then the, the best thing that we can do is to understand, okay, this is the next part of the, the human response. And this can, this can happen fast, you know, like in a few seconds, uh, or it can, it can take years. This can play out over years. You know, we can spend years in denial. We can spend years being angry and the next two phases we can spend years in, in those. So none of these are necessarily in a, in a, any kind of a time constraint. They can occur in, in many different ways over any kind of time, uh, you know, time level. So we have to understand that, that we need to transition though. We can't just stay mad, stay angry. That, that clearly is not what's helpful to us or anyone else. So what we need to do is we need to begin to problem solve. We need to begin to, and this is, a, the, you know, continuing on in that path, that journey towards acceptance. We need to begin to understand uh, what, how, what really happened in the situation, because that's how we solve real problems, right? Um, you know, the person who, whoever came up with the idea of an ice cold lemonade, they saw the problem of somebody working really hard on a hot day and, uh, you know, lemonade brought sugar, uh, which brings energy and the ice brings a nice, cold, refreshing, uh, balance to the, the terrible heat that, that the worker is experiencing. And so, you know, that ice cold lemonade is the perfect response to, you know, that manual labor on a hot day. Uh, so, uh, we need to begin to think about s solutions for the problems, right? And so, so that's really the next healthy uh, part of dealing with anger. Instead of thinking about who's to blame, we just identify who the, what, who or what is the cause of the problem. And that helps us move out of being angry. Then we can move to the next stage, which is sadness. Uh, and so it's when we, it's, we kind of, it's when we actually are able to really process and understand what has happened. It's when we can really begin to, uh, identify, okay, here's the problem. 
Um, here's how it's affected me. Here's how it's affected others. The, the cost of dealing with this, um, whether it's a, a personal time cost, a, a financial cost, um, maybe it's your life is altered forever. You've been in a, you've had a serious injury and, and, and now you're, you're going to have to learn to do things without your vision or without being able to walk or, you know, without two, two hands or two arms uh, that, that your life has been changed so dramatically in a way that it's going to affect you forever. And so now you're, you're beginning to realize, okay, now I'm going to have to, instead of being angry about what happened, I'm going to have to begin to take steps to deal with this and to help me be able to move forward in my life and to to be constructive uh, rather than destructive with that. And that 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 usually is the most difficult or I, I have found is the most difficult movement uh, going from that time of, of anger and you're just you're just enraged and you're, you're irrational in that uh frustration with the problem, you're mad at God, um, you know, you're mad at the situation, you're mad at someone, going from that to beginning to just to be sad. Because sadness suggests that we are responding to the real truth. You know, the, the real, uh, you know, the, the real, we, we've accepted what really happened instead of our initial uh, you know, f- hypothesis about what happened. We've had time to look at the facts. We've had time to say, okay, you know, now I, you know, I'm going to need to learn to, to, uh, to, you know, do, to, uh, is it reading Braille? Is that the correct way you would say that? But I don't know if you would, cause you can't see it, but, you know, using Braille as a way to communicate as a language to, to read if you, if you've lost your vision, for example. So now you're, you're accepting that you're going to have to go through that process. And that makes you sad because you've lost something that you that we all highly value and now uh, life is going to change and so um, you, you see people that are devastated by that and never recover and you see people that that accept that and have a wonderful productive and joyful and happy life and you have to and you have to ask yourself well, well what's the difference what what caused one person to uh, just self-destruct and 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 have a miserable life or choose to take their life and what caused the uh, someone else in the same situation to have a productive and joyful and meaningful life in spite of that thing that's happened and uh, and there there is and that that's really the the point of the discussion today is to for us to understand that there are two paths and that we have to choose the correct path the path as as the psalmist directs us is the righteous path the path of pursuing God trusting him understanding that he has a, a purpose and a plan for everything that happens uh, not believing that he's this you know mean and 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 indifferent God that just causes or, or arbitrarily allows things to happen, but understanding that sin is in the world. It's corrupted his good creation. It's going to continue to corrupt it until Christ returns. And so to know that he has compassion on us, it's not his desire for, he was, it was not never his desire for evil and suffering to come into the world in the first place. It was our choice as humanity to, to think that we knew better and to invite that chaos and that trouble on ourselves. So, uh, you know, that, that gets into this whole bigger theological thing, which we're not necessarily wanting to get into today, but just so that we can have the, the correct context and understanding of, of why getting to that neck, that third stage uh, of that response of that grief or, or uh, a grief response or in a response to a stress or a tragedy so that we can begin to de- really deal with the reality of the situation. And that's important. And it, and it is important for us to be proactive, whether they're just kind of waiting for someone else to solve it. And, and there, that might be the situation and we may be waiting on someone else. And so we have to accept that, that there is a waiting time. In fact, there almost always is some kind of a, a waiting time. Uh, you know, if, if you uh, lose your home because of some kind of a natural disaster, then there's a waiting time before you either get it rebuilt or you get funds to where you can go, uh, you know, start again somewhere else. Uh, that, that waiting time can be very difficult. But we also have to understand that God, God will use that, uh, that hardship and that pain to mold us and shape us. And what's really am- amazing and, and the beauty of, if, if there can be a beauty in tragedy, I, I, I guess that, that could be debated. But what, where I, what I've tried to allow the beauty of tragedy in my life to do is to, to help me to 
to be prepared for the next tragedy and to be able to handle it without having that 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 crazy out of control raging or, or anxious response and uncertain response, which I, I would love to say I've matured spiritually in my life to where I don't have those responses. Unfortunately, I, I still do to, I guess, honestly, to a lesser extent, I do believe that I'm growing in that, but boy, it seems like you just have to fight for every inch or maybe I'm just particularly stubborn. Um, but, but eventually over time, what becomes normal is that tragedy happens, hardship happens, grief uh, is going to, and stress is, or grief is going to come as a result of stress. And so if I am, if my normal, uh, if my normalcy bias includes that, now I'm not having that extreme response because that is a part of, of what I can expect from life, that I can expect that I am one phone call, I am one step away from tragedy. And I'm not living in fear. I'm not hiding around the corner trying to avoid it. I'm just, I'm just aware. I'm aware that that, that can be the case. If something terrible happens, it doesn't mean I'm just like, Oh, <laughs> you know, yeah, my, you know, my cousin died. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not, it's not like I'm joyful or, or indifferent or I don't care, but it just means that, that now I have a little bit better preparation and, and I'm in a, a more correct psychological state to, confront and deal with that situation. It's not a coincidence that people in corporate America or in the educational system or in the judicial system, whatever, wherever it is, even in church, it's not a coincidence that the people that handle mass chaos and trouble and problems well with a calm, level-headed mind, problem-solving the, the, th- uh, the situation and getting through it, it's not a coincidence that they make 50, 100, 200 dollars an hour, uh, you know, plus maybe they get paid millions of dollars. CEOs of companies that 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 is basically their whole reason for living is to to solve problems in companies. Well, then that that's not a wonder that they get paid more than someone else who makes minimum wage or a lesser wage that is really not solving a problem or dealing dealing with those psychological stressors. So so what can we draw from that? Well, we can draw that it is very beneficial not only spiritually from a spiritual growth perspective and from a peace and life perspective, but it's very beneficial as far as us thriving in the world as we interact in, in business and, and, and at church and, and in different places that, that we excel at that because the people that can grasp and master and understand this process, they will function better in the world than those who, who cannot, that either choose to run from it or to get stuck in these stages of it or refuse to grow, uh, refuse to accept, uh, you know, God's lordship in their life, his authority in their life. Um, so, so that, that's a, that's a big, that's kind of, I mean, it's not kind of, it, it is a very big deal. And it's something that really can make or break the six, the, the amount of success we have living our lives is how we handle this. All right. So once we get to the place where, you know, we, we've gotten through the denial phase, we've gotten through the, the rage and the anger, uh, of the situation we have begin, we, we've, we're going through experiencing sadness because that sadness is a sign that we're beginning to accept what really happened. And we're beginning to look at the facts, not in a skewed way, but, but to correctly assess, okay, here's, here's what happened. Here's how I need to, to solve the problem. Then we can get to the fourth stage, which is the finish line, the end of the journey. You know, we get out of the wilderness, uh, you know, however you want to look at it. Uh, we finish the race and we come to that place of acceptance. That's the fourth stage where now we are in a peaceful state. We've gone through this hardship. We've, we've discovered how we're going to handle the situation. We've had time to acclimate to it emotionally and psychologically. And now we can operate within it. All right. Just like the blind person that learns to read Braille, they learn to, to live their life in spite of that, that challenge and that difficulty. And, uh, and oftentimes can be more influential and effective and have a more meaningful life than someone with all of their faculties. So, uh, we have to be, to understand that, that no matter how it feels or seems when tragedy strikes, it doesn't mean that we can't go on and live a great life. That's one reason why, uh, in, in my 
you know, ministry and my mindset of life that, that, that I spend a lot of time being prepared and in the world of preparedness and, and learning and uh, how to deal with certain, you know, more long-term type calamities, uh, you know, like a, a, a nuclear war or other things is because I, my hope is that even in that situation, when the absolute worst happens and life as we know it really does change, that I am able to adapt to that and I'm able to not just survive but to thrive in that situation and to be able to cope with it emotionally, to be able to have resources and skills to deal with that. And so what I've learned is that in preparing for the worst situation, it actually prepares me for all of the lesser situations in life, even the very, you know, very minor things like, you know, what what to do if if, if I suffer a financial loss or what to do if, uh, you know, this or that happens that not that I'm ready for everything and I'm just going to, you know, surf every wave and solve every problem, but to where I've had some measure of of preparedness or, or practice or or experience with a, 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 a strife or a difficulty or a problem that when the time comes, I will be able to be a part of the solution rather than, you know, the sheep that are running or, and panicking and, and such. And so uh, I hope that this has been beneficial. I hope that, that assessing and understanding our response, how we uh, tend to handle things, uh, and in contrast, how God has showed us in, in his word, how we ought to handle things, um, uh, as we see in Psalms chapter 34, that in doing that, you can begin, if you're not already in this process of, of, of learning to, to go through times of hardship, uh, learning from it, being, being, uh, made, become, uh, being made, I don't know, made greater is the right term, but, uh, being refined and, and being, you know, finding the blessing in that hardship. Because, I mean, honestly, here's the thing you might say, well, I don't want to, well, yeah, I don't want to either, but I can either, I'm going to, if I'm going to have to go through it either way, I might as well draw from it the most that I can. It's kind of like mitigating loss. Um, you know, I want to, if I'm going to experience loss, I might as well ex take as little loss as I possibly can. So that I'm going to work to minimize that loss. It's really kind of the, what we're talking about here is that God has given us a way. Cause remember his promise here, let's go back for just a minute and we'll kind of end with this. Remember that his promise, I'm going to go back to where I was, is that in verse 19, many adversities come to the one who is righteous. All right, so we know if we were following God, just like anyone else, we're going to have problems and trouble. But what is God's promise? He delivers him from them all. And what I've begun to understand is that his deliverance is not only the solving of those problems. It's not him taking away. Being delivered doesn't mean he takes away the problem. It means that he gives us the strength to walk through it, right? So what would be an example of that? Well, let's say that you're not able to swim, right? And so you, uh, you've got to cross a river and you have to, and it's either cross the river or die. Well, what can God do? He could teleport you across the river, correct? Okay, could do that. He does that sometimes in our life. But what else could he do? Well, even better, he could teach us to swim. If we learn to swim, we can swim across the river. Now we've gained a skill. We've gained confidence. We have an ability to uh, uh, respond to that problem the next time. And so I, I, I have to accept or understand that, that even though I do not in any way claim to know the mind of God, I do understand that and see and can assess that that is how he handles things in life, that he teaches us skills, he teaches us ways to cope and to deal with those problems so that in the future we are stronger, we are better, we are more, we are made more righteous, more conformed to his image of righteousness, and that, that in that we are able to to be that light, to be that living gospel uh, by how we handle situations and how we live. And so in that illustration, you know, learning to swim across the river, that may be how God delivers me. So just because I had to swim and I had to do some work, does that mean God didn't deliver me? 
not at all. He's the one who taught me how to swim. So I hope that that is a blessing to you today. In fact, uh, you know, maybe you save this on your, your YouTube playlist so that when you go through a time of hardship or if you have a friend that's going through a really deep struggle, would you bless that friend right now? Would you just click the share button and send this the link to this video to them via text, Facebook message, Instagram, however you want to do it. And let it be a blessing to them and let it, instead of them having to face that challenge alone and with uncertainty, they can have, uh, you know, the, the opportunity of this message that's from God word that can help them go through that situation or save it to your playlist so that when you're going through that you can kind of kind of think through this again and, and and allow god's word to instruct and inform you well guys thank you for for your time uh it's you know i i hope that this is uh that this porch talk ministry is is helpful i hope it gives you encouragement i hope it gives you a supplement to your normal bible study and teaching uh, other teachings that you're taking in and i hope that you just use it as as a part of your arsenal of spiritual growth uh to point you towards um, you know, Christ our Savior. I want to encourage anybody that that's listening that doesn't go to church normally, um, go go find a church to go to for Easter. We'd love to have you at River Bluff Fellowship, 2655 East Farm Road, 188 in Ozark. Uh, or, but if you live somewhere else, or even if you live here and and, and you're just looking for a, a maybe some, a different place to go, find a place to go. Easter is such a special Sunday. You don't want to miss out on what God might speak to you as we celebrate the death and resurrection. Uh, as we as we celebrate, I don't know the suffering part of that death, but as we celebrate what was accomplished through Christ's death and resurrection, it's a big day and I invite you to join us or, or just to find a church somewhere to attend. Well, blessings to you. Let me close in a word of prayer and uh, we'll go about uh, our busy days. Lord, thank you for how you've blessed in, in us with your word. And I pray, Lord, that we would take it into our hearts. God, I pray that you would comfort us when those times of difficulty and hardship and stress occur in our lives. Lord, let us not be dismayed or to run in fear, but to be strong and courageous, knowing that you have a plan and a purpose for all things. And God, we just thank you uh, that you have allowed us the, the privilege to live life today. I pray a blessing on every listener, that you would protect them, and that when they have to go through difficult times, Lord, that you would strengthen them. Let them go through it with power and with determination, Lord, uh, according to your purposes. And we just pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.